if I was five years old and you were trying to explain this to me, <laughs> is there ways to try to sneak up to the to to what this unified world of mathematics looks like. You said number theory, you said geometry, words like topology. What does this universe begin to look like? Are these, what should we imagine in our mind? Is it a, a three-dimensional surface? And we're <laughs> trying to say something about it. Is it uh, triangles and squares and cubes? Like what What are we supposed to imagine in our minds? Is this natural number? What? What's a good thing to try to, for people that don't know any of these tools, except maybe some basic calculus and geometry from high school that they should keep in their minds as to the unified world of mathematics that also allows us to explore the unified world of physics. The, I mean, what, what I find kind of remarkable about this is the way in which these, we've discovered these ideas, but they're, they're actually quite alien to our everyday understanding. You know, we, grow up in this three spatial dimensional world and we have intimate understanding of certain kinds of geometry and certain kinds of things. But um, these things that we've discovered in both math and physics are that they're not at all close, have any obvious connection to kind of human everyday experience, that they're, they're really quite different. And I can say some of my initial fascination with this when I was uh, young and starting to learn about it was actually exactly this um, this kind of arcane nature of these things. It was a little bit like being being told, well, there are these kind of se semi-mystical experience that you can acquire by you know, long study and whatever, except that it, that it was actually true. I mean, there's actually evidence that this actually works. So you know, I'm a, a little bit wary of, of trying to give people that kind of thing because I think it's mostly misleading. But one thing to say is that, you know, that geometry is, is a large part of it. And, um, Maybe one interesting thing to say very that's about more recent, some of the most recent ideas is that it um when we think about the geometry of our space and time, it's kind of three spatial and one time dimension. It, it's a um physics is in some sense about something that's kind of four dimensional in a way. Mm -hmm. And that a really interesting thing about um some of the recent developments in number theory have been to realize that the um these ideas that we were looking at, you know, naturally fit into a context where your your theory is for is kind of four dimensional. So, so 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 geom I mean, geometry is a big part of this, and, and and we know a lot and feel a lot about you know two one two three dimensional geometry. So wait wait a minute. So we can at least rely on uh, the four dimensions of space and time, and say that we can get pretty far by working in that in those four dimensions. I thought you were going to scare me that we're going to have to go to many, 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 many more dimensions than that. My, my, my point of view, which is which goes against a lot of these ideas about unification, is that, no, this is really, everything we, we know about really is about four dimensions that, um, and, and that you can actually understand a lot of these structures that we've been seeing in fundamental physics and in, in number theory, just in terms of four dimensions, that it's kind of, it's in some sense I would claim has been a really, um, has been kind of a mistake that, that physicists have made in for decades and decades to try to, to to try to go to higher dimensions to try to to formulate a theory in higher dimensions and then then you're stuck with the problem of how do you get rid of all these extra dimensions that you've created and because because we only ever see anything in four dimensions that kind of thing leads us astray you think so so creating all these extra dimensions just to get to give yourself extra degrees of freedom. Yeah, uh, isn't that? I mean, isn't that the process of mathematics? Is to create all of these trajectories for yourself, but eventually you have to end up at the, uh, at, the at a, like a final place. But it's okay to it's it's okay to sort of um, create abstract objects on your path to uh, proving something. Yeah, so, yeah, certainly. But and from from mathematician's point of view, I mean, the kinds of mathematician is also very different than physicists, and that. We like to develop very general theories. We like to, if we have an idea, we want to um, see what's the greatest generality in which you can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of most of the ways geometry is formulated um, by mathematicians, it, it really doesn't matter. It, it works in any dimension. We can do one, two, three, four, any any number. There's no particular, for most of geometry, there's no particular special thing about four. But um, and. Anyway, but but what physicists have have, found, have been trying to do over the years is try to understand 
these fundamental theories in a geometrical way. And it's very tempting to kind of just start bringing in extra dimensions to, to, and, and using them to explain the structure. But it, um, tip, typically this, this attempt kind of founders because you just don't know, you, you end up not being able to explain why we only see four. And, you know, it, it is nice in the space of physics that, uh, like if you look at Fermat's last theorem, it's much easier to prove that there's no solution for n equals three than it is for the general case. And, yeah. and so I guess that's the nice benefit of being a physicist is you don't have to worry about the general case because we live in a universe with n equals four in this case. Yeah, the phys physicists are very interested in saying something about specific examples. And I find that interesting even when, when I'm trying to do things uh, in mathematics and I'm trying even teaching courses and to mathematics students, I find that I'm teaching them in a different way than um, most mathematicians because I'm very often f very focused on examples, on, on what's mm -hmm. what's kind of the crucial example that shows how this, um, this powerful new mathematical technique, how it works and why you would want to do it. Um, and I'm less interested in kind of, you know, proving a precise theorem about exactly when it's going to work and when it's not going to work. Do you usually think about really simple examples, like uh, both for teaching and when you try to solve a difficult problem? Are you do you construct like the simplest possible examples that captures the fundamentals of the problem and try to solve it? Yeah, yeah, I I exactly. That's often a really fruitful way to, if you've got some idea, to you just to kind of try to boil it down to what's the simplest situation in which this kind of thing is going to happen and, and then try to really understand that and understand that. And that, that is almost always a really good way to get insight into. Do you work with uh, paper and pen? Or like, for example, for me, um, coming from the programming side, if you if I look at a model, if I look at some kind of mathematical object, I like to mess around with it sort of numerically. Uh, I just visualize different parts of it, visualize however I can. So most of the work is like with neural networks, for example, yep. is you try to play with the simplest possible example and just to build up intuition by, um, you know, any kind of object has a bunch of variables in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you start to mess around with them in different ways and visualize in different ways to start to build intuition. Or do you go the Einstein route and just imagine like uh, everything inside your mind and sort of build like thought experiments and then work purely on paper and pen. Well, the, the problem with this kind of stuff that I'm interested in is it, you, you rarely can kind of, it's rarely something that is really kind of, or even the simplest example, you know, it can, is you can kind of see what's going on by it, looking at something happening in three dimensions. Right. There's, there's generally this, the structures involved are, um, either they're more abstract or if you try to kind of embed them in some kind of space and where you could um, manipulate them in some kind of geometrical way, it, it's going to be a much higher dimensional space. So even simple examples, the embedding them into three dimensional space, you're losing a lot. Yeah. Or, but, but to capture what you're, what you're trying to understand about them, you have to go to four or more dimensions. So it starts to get to be hard to, I mean, you can train yourself to, to try it as much as to kind of, think about things in, in your mind. And, you know, I often use, use pad and paper and I'm often, if I'm in my office, I often use the blackboard um, and you are kind of drawing things, but they're really kind of more abstract representations of how things are supposed to fit together. And they're not really, unfortunately, not just kind of really living in three dimensions where you can under Are we supposed to be sad or excited by the fact that our human minds can't fully comprehend the kind of mathematics you're talking about? I, I mean, <laughs> what do we make of that? I mean, to me, that makes me quite sad. It makes me, it makes it seem like there's a giant mystery out there that we'll never truly get to experience directly. It is kind of sad, you know, how difficult this is. I mean, or I would put it a different way that, um, you know, most questions that people have about this kind of thing, you know, you couldn't, you can give them a really a, a true answer and really understand it, but. The problem is is one more of um of time. It's like, yes, you know, I could explain to you how this works, but you'd have to be willing to sit down with me and and you know work at this repeatedly for you know for hours and days and weeks, and you'd, you'd have, I mean it's just going to take that long for your mind to really wrap itself around what's going on. And um, 
and that so that does make things in, in, inaccessible, which is uh, which is sad. But it again, I mean, it's just kind of part of life that we all have a limited amount of time, and we have to decide what we're gonna what we're gonna spend our time doing. 